They were among the most horrible events in, hu in world history. Tonight, a Holocaust survivor returns and remembers so that others will never forget. Henry Ortel of Little Canada lived through the horrors of Auschwitz for nearly a year. Only good luck and the fact the Nazis valued his skill as a furniture maker kept Henry alive. Just last month, Henry returned to Auschwitz, a free man, to confront the memories that have haunted him and the world for half a century. What you're about to see is a testament to one man's bravery and his hope the mistakes of the past will never be repeated. Here's Carol Evans, Brad Woodard. For centuries, the bells have beckoned them from Poland's countryside. Each Sunday on the outskirts of Krakow, as one religious service ends, elsewhere another is getting underway. Through times of upheaval and relative calm, Catholicism has remained a constant here. But in a country where one faith has flourished, another was almost destroyed. There's an irony in the deeply religious nature of this country. Jesus Christ was a Jew. And if he would have returned during the Nazi time, he also would have been grabbed and sent possibly to Auschwitz and landed in the gas chambers. If 76-year-old Henry Ortel seems pensive as Poland's countryside flashes past his window, it's because he's made this trip before. Only it was supposed to be a one-way trip from which he and millions of others would never return. It was October of 1944, and Ortel, seen here in a photo from his youth in Berlin, was herded into a cattle car for transport to Auschwitz. You were looking around and you saw uh, all kinds of people, men, women, old folks, children of all ages, infants. They shoved and beat these people into that opening until it seemed that there was nobody else to be shoved in anymore. And then they slammed the door shut. The door would remain shut for the entire trip, two and a half days with no food or water. When the train finally stopped, a full third of its passengers were already dead and those still living were ordered onto the platform of Auschwitz No. 2, also known as Birkenau. The train rolling in, I remember that only two well as we were on that thing. Half a century later, Henry approaches the platform with great trepidation. On the ramp, we smelled the stench of burning flesh that came from the smoke of the chimneys. The sights and sounds still fresh in his mind. SS men or hollering out the orders, get out of the train, fast, 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 schnell, schnell, schnell. And so began the selection process. On this platform where we're standing, the fates of millions of people were literally determined with the wave of a hand. Uh, you had to build a single file, and we, and we marched towards NSS men. In most cases, it was with Mengele, not in mine. Your faith was completely in the hands of this guy, of this one man, a member of the super race, a member of the master race. And without ever saying a word, his thumbs just went this way or that way. Those who looked strong enough for labor were sent to one side, everyone else, mostly elderly people, women, and children, to the other. Small children were fully aware of the doom that was hanging over everybody. They clung onto legs of whatever adult-like person was there. As the order came that they had to be separated. It's, it's, it's a satanic scene. It's a satanic scene. Then uh, finally trucks arrived, loaded the kids up, and, they loaded, and the trucks went into the direction of the big smokestacks that were standing over there. None of those who headed in the direction of the smokestacks ever returned. In fact, upon their arrival, seven out of 10 people immediately were sent to the gas chambers and then the ovens. As the Allies approached, the Nazis tried to dismantle this elaborate factory of death in an effort to conceal their atrocities. But in roughly three years, well over a million people perished here, 90% of them Jewish. Three kilometers away, the gate at the entrance to Auschwitz number one reads, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free. 
Well, it's part of a whole process of deception to make people feel at ease. To make In reality, it was said of Auschwitz that the only way out was through the chimney. And here, the gas chamber where the Nazis first perfected their killing techniques remains intact. Disguised as a shower room, prisoners were ordered to disrobe and file into the building. Nothing could have prepared them for what they were about to encounter. And then all of a sudden, the doors were shut with a bang, and uh, uh, after a little while, people noticed the shower didn't uh, start, and suddenly pellets were thrown to the opening like this up here, and people noticed suddenly that they were breathing in some kind of a gas, and of course, a panic started. People hollering, clawing at each other, clawing at the walls, banging against the doors. And that was probably the most indescribable scene that you can imagine. After a few minutes, everything was quiet. The gas had done its work, and after that, people were taken out, and we were taken right next door to into the crematorium, and were uh, put into the ovens and changed into ashes. It was a system run with slaughterhouse-like efficiency. Ashes were converted into fertilizer. Bones and any remaining fat were made into soap. Before their bodies were placed in the ovens, hair was shorn from the dead to be woven into cloth. The point of view of the Nazis was that they were not dealing with human beings. They were dealing with subhumans, as they called them, the Untermenschen. Surrounded by the remnants of what was to be Hitler's final solution, his presence here is nothing short of a miracle, though in Henry's eyes, something short of divine intervention. I don't dare to say, to say that God saved me. Why didn't he save the others? I don't know. I don't, frankly, I don't know what God was thinking at those days at all. Darkness provided no relief from the horrors of the day. With hundreds of people sleeping in barracks elbow to elbow, death became their bedfellow. Every night, literally dozens, dozens dead people that were pulled out of these shelves. If there was the dead body in the top bunk, we would climb up like this here until we reached the body, then pull them over and then let them drop to the ground onto the cement floor because we were too weak ourselves uh, to, to carry unnecessary weight. And then outside there was a, already a pile of bodies and we just put them on top and that was it. And later the trucks came, loaded them up out there and took them to the crematorium. Just a few hundred yards from where Henry slept, his mother was killed. The rubble that used to be the crematorium, her final resting place. I might stand on parts of her ashes right now here because it was strewn all over the place. And uh, What is that like for you? It, it does two things. That I am here gives me in that respect some satisfaction, but it also it frightens me and it uh, angers me, the anger is welling up in me, uh, but there's nothing I can do at this point, nothing. I can only hope that the world learns from this, that the world learns that hatred has to be eradicated. Henry is among several Holocaust survivors living in the Twin Cities. They are the last living links to this chapter in history. We asked Henry to make this trip with us. His expenses were paid by the Jewish Community Relations Council. They know many others interested in telling their story. If you are interested in hearing any of their speakers, call the Jewish Community Relations Council. Their number is 338-7816. That number again, 338-7816.